I am reading from the eighth chapter of Romans, and I am going to choose to use verse 37 as a text. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are conquerors through him. No other reason. God never intended for his children to be the victim. But we are the victor. He never intended for us to be the conquered ones. We are more than conquerors. Now I heard a beautiful illustration of that word more than conquer. We know what conquerors are. You get two men into a ring and that are fighting for a prize. And the one that comes out alive is the conqueror. I heard the story of two heavyweight fighters. One was the champion, and the other one was the contender. And the heavyweight champion won his fight and came out of that thing as the conqueror. He conquered his foe. He destroyed, he obliterated his enemy. It was a million-dollar gate, and for that prize, he received one million dollars. He took that million dollar check and went home and turned it over to the wife. She is more than conqueror. We are not to conquer because Jesus already conquered the devil. Do you see what I'm getting at? The battle is not our battle, but the battle is the Lord's battle. And all we got to do is maintain our joy and keep that shout going because the battle's already won and we are more than conqueror. And he put the paycheck right in our hole, in our hand. Somebody shout amen with me. More than conquerors. Now, in this particular scripture reading, you that are listening by means of radio, I want you to begin with verse 30, 31, and read right through to the end of, of that chapter. I read this in the hearing of my audience. I don't have time to read all this on radio, so you read it. But I believe that what God is trying to convey to the church, that Jesus died on that cross to make sure every one of us have been liberated and set free. We are a free-born people. And there are certain freedoms that God wants us to enjoy that the church does not possess. It does not possess them, but I believe God wants us to possess them. Now, we are living in a nation where we enjoy freedom. I'm talking about the natural man now. Freedom is the greatest legacy of American democracy. It became a reality over 200 years ago. 1776, the cradle of our liberty is in the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 1976, they celebrated the bicentennial year. And it just happened that we had our tent up in that city in 1976. Celebrating the independence of America. Freedom. And there's no other implement in our history, no greater symbol that sacred right that we have as Americans and it's in American history, is that what we call the Liberty Bell? And it, it's there in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I've been to Independence Hall. I've seen the crack. I've fingered the crack. But that Liberty Bell is a symbol of America's freedom. Now, I didn't come here to give you a history lesson. But I'm going to use this particular freedom we enjoy as Americans, and I'm going to bring it in to another realm, and that's the spiritual realm. If man wants us to be free as far as governments are concerned, think how much more God wants us to be free. Can you shout amen with me, somebody? Freedom. Thank God we've been born to that free woman. Now, on that Liberty Bell, you will find an inscription. 
a quotation that was taken from Leviticus chapter 25 10 it's a portion of the Bible that is inscribed right on that Liberty Bell and it says proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all the inhabitants thereof now, I'm not here as a representative of the government but I'm here as a representative of Jesus Christ and I claim to proclaim liberty to all the inhabitants of the land every one of you who name the name of Jesus Christ you have been liberated you have been set free you are free at last to all the inhabitants thereof that means every one of us now the power of this dynamic proclamation has re-echoed and reverberated in clarion tones down through the decades for two solid centuries. Historically then, I believe that this is the greatest message to you and to me as Americans and as a nation. But, and I say but, there is in a spiritual sense an incomparable greater message to the church it transcends and it eclipses all other pre-existing pre-existing proclamations it's the magna carta it is the emancipation proclamation it's the declaration of independence all rolled into one and it's wrapped up in God's freedoms. It's all wrapped up in one. Isaiah had it. He prophesied it. It's God's declaration of independence. You are free. Isaiah prophesied it in the ancient prophecies. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he hath anointed me to preach this gospel to the poor to open the prison doors to them that are bound hear me church if you're still in sin you need to be free if you have blind eyes you need to be free if you are sick or diseased or afflicted you need to be free this is the message that we are preaching God's people have been liberated and this is the message that we preach can you raise your hands and shout amen with me somebody there's a young man sitting right here on the front row. Stand up, son, with that hat on. See him? Cerebral palsy for 32 years. They had me on a, a television station, Paul and Jan Crouch on Trinity Broadcasting, and he picked it up at 12 o'clock midnight, and God healed him of cerebral palsy. 32 years in bondage. God set him free, and he came down here to this tent to let the world know he is free. What are these four freedoms I've been talking about? There's four freedoms that Paul enumerates here in this chapter that I read. Our late great American artist by the name of Norman Rockwell, he graphically portrayed the four freedoms that we enjoy in this country. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of choice, and freedom of the press. Back in 1941, I was just a young 14-year-old, 15-year-old boy. January the 6th, President Roosevelt made his speech to Congress. Much of that speech has already been forgotten. But there's four things that he hoped for. He said four things he was looking forward to a world founded on these four human freedoms. That's freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Four things. Now we haven't been free from one of them since these presidents been in office. We've always been wanting. There's been a lot of fear. The world, not one place, have they moved in to these four freedoms. 
that President Roosevelt. These are human freedoms. But I want you to know there is an infinitely greater freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And it's fourfold also. And Paul enumerates them in this eighth chapter. And I believe that every one of us who name the name of Jesus, God doesn't want us to live in bondage. But he wants to liberate us and set us free. I quoted the first one a long time ago in this eighth chapter. It says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? What is that first freedom? It's a freedom from fear. And I refuse to be afraid. Can you raise your hands and shout amen with me, somebody? Let me get back to that text, Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Four freedoms that God spells out to the church. And I want you to take inventory with me to find out whether or not you have been free. Everywhere I go, I find people that are in bondage to fear. They have a fear that they're not going to be healed. Because every time an evangelist comes to town, they get in his prayer line, get hands laid on them, get oil poured on them, get slapped in the head, get knocked down, and they're still sick. When the word of God is preached and the prayer line is asked for people to come to be healed, well, I ain't going to get it anyway. I've had hands laid on me 12 times and still ain't got it. God's still a healer. Fear grips people's hearts. Christians, young women are afraid they ain't never going to get married. Then when they get married, they're afraid they ain't going to stay married. Now that they're married and left home, they're fearful they won't get a job. And after God gives them a job, they're afraid they're going to get fired. They're fearful they ain't never going to get a house. And when they pay the down payment, they're afraid they ain't going to make the monthly payments. Never going to drive an automobile. They have a fear they'll never have it. But when God blesses them with it, then they're afraid they can't meet the payments for that. They're afraid to go to sleep because they're afraid they might not get up. Revelation 21.8 says, But the fearful and the unbelieving, along with the murderer and the abominable, the whoremonger, they're going to go to the lake that burneth with fire. But what hits up the list, it is the fearful and the unbelieving. Hear me! God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Can you raise your hands and shout amen with me? If God before me, you can't even be against me. I have no fear of the devil. In fact, I'm going to make the devil afraid of me. Instead of him chasing me, I'm going to chase him and let him know greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You go through life whipped, coming to church. Pray for me, Pastor. That devil's after me again. I wish he'd get off me and get on somebody else for a while. Before this tent comes down, you're going to get rid of that fear. Hallelujah. And instead of you running to the pastor saying, pray for me, old Slewfoot will be running to your pastor. And he's going to say, Pastor, get that saint off my back. I'm tired of being chased by that, by that Christian. How would you like to flip your light on when you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and the devil says, oh no, he's getting up again. My God, he's going to be after me again. Another whole day of being tormented by one of those Christians. God never intended for you to run from a devil, but God intended for you to chase the devil. One of you shall chase a thousand. Two of you shall put two, ten thousand to flight. And according to those odds, three of you can move a hundred thousand and four of you can chase a million there is no defeat we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord somebody shout yes turn back to 
Isaiah, if you will, chapter 41. I did a whole series on this. 41.10. Listen to me. Keep your radio on. Fear thou not. Talk to me. Who is thee? Me. Well, then if he's with me, why should I be afraid? My yoke is easy. Then how come you go around saying it's a hard old way? Jesus said my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Do you know why it's light? Because you're yoked up to Jesus. And, and he carries the load for you. He does all the work, and you just go along for the ride. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a God that said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. He's right there in the middle of the trouble. He's in the middle of the fire. He's in the hospital room. He's there on the job when they're talking all kind of dirt. He's right there by your side. He said, fear thou not. I am with thee. Fret not. Don't be afraid. Stop it. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Now there's four things that he tells us to do. First of all, trust in the Lord. That word trust is a synonymous term with the word faith. Have faith in God. You can place your weight on his word. If he said it, he'll do it. And if he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. Trusting God for your soul, for your body, for your mind. I heard Dr. C.M. Ward say, he said, health plans are getting so high, God is forcing his children back into a place where we're going to have to trust him because we can't afford to be sick anymore. It costs too much to have health insurance. God is forcing us into a place where we can trust him. I was riding down the turnpike in my automobile. Had it on cruise control. Talking in tongues, prophesying, dancing in the spirit while I'm driving. It was on cruise. You never danced while you drove? You don't know what you're missing. I was driving from Philadelphia to Chicago, all turnpike. Pennsylvania turnpike, Ohio turnpike, Indiana turnpike. Oh, I love them turnpikes. No stops. And I was having a Holy Ghost time. Nobody in there telling me, you're not in the spirit. Just me and Jesus doing our own thing. You know, having, having a church. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of you ladies have your best time at home and nobody around. Isn't that right? Just you and Jesus. I mean, I was feeling good and I was halfway through Ohio when all of a sudden a pain struck me here in the left side around the fifth rib. And I doubled over the steering wheel. And something was sitting on my shoulder. It was Slewfoot. And I wondered how he got in that car. And while I was doubled over, you know what he said? Heart trouble. And I said, yeah. My heart did a couple flips. I pulled over to the shoulder of the road, hit the brake, took it off a cruise, and stopped. Wasn't talking in tongues now. One dancing no more. Devil knows how to take that dance out of you. All he got to do is put one little pain on you, and you'll think you got something you ain't never heard of. Then he started talking to me. He said, how many people did you bury this week? Now he's talking about death. And I'm talking back to him. Four. Brother so-and-so and sister and brother. I said, oh, Lord, no. Hurt and worse. Then he got personal. He said, how many brothers you have dead? I said, there's Reuben, Henry, and Charles. Ah, if I'd have seen a grave, I'd have jumped in the thing. Man, I was scared to death. Didn't even have my wife with me. Because she can rub out the pain. You know what I mean? Somebody to console you. Just to have somebody rub your brow a little bit. Or just, rub, oh, it feels so, put the devil to bed. But ain't nobody around but me and old Slewfoot. Can't even feel God now. He's gone. Been talking in tongues for the last 300 miles. I came to my senses and I said, you filthy, rotten, lying devil. Now, it's not enough to be fearful. Don't be fearful. Fret not. Trust. 
but not just trust. He said, delight yourself. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That means you won't even have to get in a prayer line. You won't even have to let a preacher lay hands on you. Just delight yourself. What does that mean? That means delight yourself. Look what Webster says about it. That which affords extreme enjoyment. Just by looking at some Christians, they're not enjoying anything. They look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. When you see people dancing, they're not dancing for your benefit. They're not trying to delight you. They're trying to delight themselves. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. What am I trying to tell you? Get happy. Best thing in the world for arthritis is dancing in the spirit. Hallelujah. You'll dance Arthur right out of your joints. Can you shout praise the Lord with me, somebody? Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I'm reading from the 8th chapter of Romans. I'm using verse 37 as a text. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. The four freedoms that God has given to you and to me who have come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We who were sometimes darkness, now we are light. And thank God for the light of this gospel that has been shed abroad in our hearts. Freedom from fear, number one. The second freedom you will find in that 32nd verse in the last phrase, but let me read it all. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely, I'm going to underline that word, freely give us all things. God offered, he paid that supreme price. He offered his son on that cross 2,000 years ago. He took your sin so you don't have to bear it any longer. Now, since this is proxy night, you will find in the Word of God, I always like to quote this story about this little Syrophoenician woman. She was coming to Jesus in behalf of a daughter. That's proxy. A daughter that was grievously vexed and tormented of a devil. Jesus was come only for the lost sheep of Israel. This woman was an outcast. She had no business even being there in the meeting. And Jesus was setting up an evangelistic crusade, and that woman comes in and doesn't even know how to act in church. She cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Do you notice she calls him by his messianic name? The son of David? Why, even his own people don't even know who he is. And she said, I have a daughter home, grievously vexed, tormented of a devil. This was a need. And this woman was about to show him the faith that he's trying to teach to his own kids. And they don't have it yet. The disciples came to him and said, Master, can't you get rid of that woman? She's bothering us. Do you notice it's the people that shout out that bothers folks? Blind Bartimaeus began to cry out, and they pulled their money out and said, Sit down and be quiet. <laughs> the Bible said he shouted louder. Jesus tried to hush this woman, and he said, Daughter, it is not meat for me to give the children's bread the dogs. Called her a dog. She looked at him and she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Now we thrill over that, but that's not what I thrill over. What I thrill over is when Jesus looks at that woman and he tells her something he never told Peter. But this little Syrophoenician woman, he looks at her and he said, oh woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto you, even as thou wilt. Now, can I bring that into everyday terms? This is what he literally said to that woman. Whatever you want, 
You got it. Now this woman is enjoying one of these four freedoms I'm talking about. Freedom from what? Never said it to his disciples, but he said it to this woman. He never saw this kind of faith before. And the woman looked at him and smiled and said, Thank you, Lord. Bye. That's all I wanted to hear. And when she got home, her daughter was clothed and in her right mind. There's a song we sing here under this tent. I got just what I wanted. I got just what I wanted. I got just what I wanted from the Lord. God's will and God's desire for every one of us who has come in contact with Jesus Christ is to have freedom from what? We have not moved into this freedom. And I want to try to help you get into this area if we ever get a vision of who God is and what He is and what rightfully belongs to you. I've come with good news. You are an heir of God. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ and everything God owns, you are part owner of it because you have come to Jesus Christ. It belongs to you. David in that 23rd Psalm said, The Lord is my shepherd I shall not want David had a vision of what Jesus meant when he died on Calvary, how he will freely give us all things. You don't know who you are. We act like paupers when we ought to be sons of the king. You are somebody. Get your chin right out of your chest and throw them shoulders back and let the world know you are a son of God. Can you raise your hands and shout amen? This little Syrophoenician woman is showing the whole house of Israel how to believe God. She said, I'm just hanging around here picking up what they're not eating. And she's saying, Lord, they ain't eating too good. There's a lot of crumbs around here. Listen to me, beloved, and don't you ever forget this. God is a healer, and he provided healing for his church. But the church is a sick church. Healing is the children's bread. And the church is not even eating the bread that God put on the table. But it has to be the strangers that come in that are getting the healings and the miracles and the deliverance while the church is still playing church, reverted back to its form and ceremony and ritual. God said he has freely given us all things. It belongs to you. You are a child of God. Enjoy it. John 10.10 10 says the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he said, I am come that you might have life and then that you might have it more abundantly. Pardon me while I shout a little bit. My God, when he saved me, I was a pauper. I was in the depths of sin. I had the curse of death on my neck. I was bound for hell. But while I was in this condition, he reached down with that strong right hand, picked me up, washed me in his blood, clothed me with his righteousness, wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and then calls me Son. Woo! And ever since we've been saved, we've been going around saying, it's a hard old way. I'm one of God's poor children. God ain't got no poor kids. When God does something, he does it great. Can you shout amen, somebody? A more abundant life. The devil's been going around telling you you aren't nobody. You weren't when you were walking with him, but now you're a child of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus. He made something out of you. Took you out of the pit, and he's making you the aristocracy of the new Jerusalem. You are a son of God. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord? When he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep. What were they doing? washing their nets. Simon answered and said, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Now I know he is Pentecostal. See how people think? This is their level. This is the level of their thinking. We've taken nothing. Toiled all night long. I ain't going fishing in that spot. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. Thank God he had enough sense to do that. 
And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break, and they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them, and they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. This is the kind of a God that we have. When he does it, he does it with a super abundant supply. I have people come to me and they get in the prayer line and they say, will you pray for me and ask God to send in just my rent money? I said, I ain't going to pray just for you to get your rent money. I'm going to ask him to give you some more so you can bring out here. What's wrong with you? If you're going to ask, ask largely that your joy might be full. Church, we got this thing wrong. All we want to do is get by. I've even heard Christians say, oh, if I could just make it to heaven on the skin of my teeth. Some of you ain't got no teeth. When it comes time to go into heaven, I don't want to sneak in. I want them angels to stand at attention. When I come in, I want to hear, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, shout amen, somebody. This is the kind of a God that you serve. He took you while you were a pauper, and he's going to bless you. He said, if you walk in my ways, keep my commandments and my statutes. He said, all of these blessings will come upon you. They'll overtake you. God's blessings are conditional. He said, if you walk in my ways, if you keep my commandments, you keep my statutes, you do what I tell you to do, you won't even have to ask for it. He said, I'll freely give you all things. You'll walk in the blessing. You'll talk in the blessing. Everything you set your hands to, you're blessed because you're my child. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My God, if I was a sinner, I'd run down here and get saved quick. Jesus tried to instill this into the lives of his disciples. When he was preaching to the multitude, he preached a little too long. And he infringed on the supper hour. And the one who kept the money bag said, Master, it's getting late. Jesus said, tell him to sit down on the grass. Oh, no. But the one who kept the money bag said, Lord, we don't have but about a few pennies. This is the mentality of men. This is how we think. We just have a little bit. Jesus don't even need a little bit. He always starts with nothing. The irreducible minimum. If you don't believe it, look in the mirror. He started with nothing when he picked you up. Paul said, I am less than the least. He knew the secret of faith. God delights in picking up nothing and making something out of it. And he's going to show them the lesson now. And he said, Lord, here's a boy with five loaves and two fish. Now, if he'd have just stopped there, everything would have been all right. But we don't know when to shut up. He said, but what is that among so many? And don't look at me so sanctified. We all say, but we ain't sheep, we're goats. We're supposed to be sheep of his pasture. Then what are you going around butting for all the time? I know the Lord's a healer, but I know it says he'll supply my need, but all sheep are supposed to do is bah. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Yeah. I will supply all your need according to my riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Ah, yeah. God wants you to say yes to everything that he said. He said, I'm going to bless you. You are blessed everything that you touch. Don't say, but. Say, yes, Lord. This is how God operates. The little boy gives him five loaves and two fish. His mama sent him down to Hinky Dinkies to get five loaves of bread and two fish. If some of you down in Los Angeles want to know who Hinky Dinky is, that's the name of a chain, a food chain right here in Omaha. I better clarify that right now. And she sent him down to that supermarket and he brought enough bread and fish for supper. He gave it to Jesus. He fed 5,000 and sent 12 baskets full home. Can you imagine what Mama said when she saw that entourage of grocery boy deliveries coming with all the groceries? I believe she said, oh, Lord, he hit a sale. 
I'm going to send that boy to the supermarket every day. And he said, uh-uh, mama. I stopped and gave it to Jesus. If I'd have brought it right home, you'd have just had enough for supper. But because I gave it to Jesus, you got a three-month supply. That's how God works. Can you shout amen? Now, you see the human mentality? The disciple that brought that little boy said, but what is that among so many that each one may take a little? A little? That's the human mentality. God don't think in little. He filled them up. He freely gives us all things. Some of you folks that are seeking God for healing, you say, oh, if he could just take the pain away. The devil can do that. That ain't nothing but a symptom. Don't ask God just to take the pain away. He wants to heal you and restore you to perfect health. Are you listening to me? This is how God thinks. He freely gives us all things. It belongs to you as a child of God. Can you raise your hands and shout amen with me? I was preaching in Chicago some years ago when Mayor Daly was alive. There was an enterprising reporter who came across a gimmick to get readers, but it was a good thing. He visited all the banks, Brother Clendenin, in Chicago and all the environs to find out how much money was in the banks that was left unclaimed. People that died that had people's names in a will, but they didn't know it. They were ignorant of that will. And he published it in the paper. Two big pages, alphabetical order for two solid weeks. That's how many people. Now, I've been preaching in Chicago for 20 years. That reporter hooked me for a newspaper every day. I didn't read no weather report. I headed for that page. I didn't bother with the A, Bs, and Cs. I headed to the Essence. I was looking for Shambok, Shambal, Shambattle, Shadrach, Shucklebuck, everything I ever have been called. I was looking for that thing. Oh, <laughs> uh, Shamrock. I get that a lot. I was looking for Shamrock. There's something about me. If I have something coming to me, I want it. Well, you can tell by looking at me, I didn't find my name. I at least got a sermon out of it. Now, there was one particular man whose name was in there, and his buddy saw it. Now, he didn't see his name because he couldn't afford it. He was on welfare. He was drawing so much money per month on welfare. Couldn't afford the paper. So his buddy saw his name in there, and he went over to his house, and he said, You're rich, man! He said, Oh, stop bothering me. He says, You got money in the bank. He said, I was born poor, I'm going to die poor. He said, no, sir, here's your name. He said, that ain't me, that's somebody else with the same name. He said, but somebody died and left you some money. He said, I ain't never had no rich friends. It ain't me. I ain't going down. I said, Lord, he sounds just like them church folks I preach to. They don't believe anything. I'm reading this as a byline on the front page. Next day, I bought the paper, looked for my name first, and went back to the byline. And this man went down to the reporter and got the reporter to go out to convince him. He researched it. It's this man. It's his buddy. He went out there to try to get him to go down. He said, you ain't playing no April Fool joke on me. I ain't never had nothing and never will. I'm on welfare. Now, get out of here and leave me alone. I said, now I know he's Pentecostal. He goes to the editor of the paper to try. They know it's this man. If they could only just get him down there to sign his name. By this time, Mayor Daly saw it. He said, you mean tell me that man's on welfare and I'm giving him city money and he got money in the bank? We're going to get him to the bank. Mayor Daly got his chauffeur-driven limousine and went out there and knocked on that man's door and said, I'm Mayor Daly. Get in that car. I read this in the paper. Oh, I said, oh, Lord, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to knock on your door and say, I'm Brother Shambach. I come here as a man of God. You don't know what you got coming to you. Follow me. Oh, I got a sermon out of this thing. He went down there, signed his name on the dotted line. You ready for this? And he became the recipient of $5 million. 20 or 30 years ago, he befriended a man and did a favor for him. And he put his name in the will and he died. And the bank's been having that money all those years. And the interest's been compounding, compounding, compounding. And when he got his $5 million, Mayor Daly computed how much they got in welfare. And he got a check for that, all, every penny of it back. I come to tell you, somebody died and left your name in the will. I found your name in the will. Where did you see my name in the will? In the eighth chapter of Romans. To as many.
many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And if you are sons of God, you are heirs of God. And if you are heirs of God, you are joint heirs with Christ. That means everything Jesus owns, you are part owner of it. You are somebody. God has your name in the will. Woo! When you find out your name's in the will, what's the first thing you want to know? How much? You hit it on the head, honey. How much I've got coming? you got to get into the book of Ephesians to find out what you got coming. Oh, God's got it enumerated. He has freely given you all things. It's a blank check. All you've got to do is write your name on it. It belongs to you. You are a child of God. How do I know that will's real? It's got to be probated first, don't it? I want you to know that book's been probated. Back in the Psalms, it says, Thy will, O Lord. Thy word, O oh Lord, is forever settled in heaven. John 3, Jesus answered and said unto him in verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again, a word that is used in Hollywood, a word that is used in the world, and this foul spirit and insidious spirit has crept into the church to deceive the real people of God. Now, I want your good ear tonight. Because this foul spirit has crept into the church and there's a nonchalant spirit that has come into the church and everybody is born again. Ever since Jimmy Carter has been voted in as the President of the United States, because he has a born-again experience, which was his testimony. And since that time, even comedians have picked it up. And the word born-again has been on every talk show on television. It's been made fun of by people in the entertainment world. And people of God have pulled into their shell. Even sports writers are writing about it on the sports page. A young man by the name of Bjorn Borg from Sweden who came into his own in the tennis realm and every time he wins a match, the writers on the back page of the sports page, born again, referring to the young man who won another tournament. He won it again. Until that word born again does not mean very much to some people. But I want to blast it out on radio and let you know that these are the words of Jesus. And you can joke about it all you want to. But if you are not born again, you are going to split hell wide open. Larry Flint, who is the editor of one of the biggest porno magazines in the country showing pictures of naked women in the most vulgar acts that can ever be seen, who has claimed to be born again and still publishes the rot and the filth and the corruption that he is, that he is in. When you are born again, you will come out from the world and be separated and touch not the unclean thing. Can you shout amen, somebody? You say, Brother Shambach, should we act as judges? No, not as a judge. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. If you want to know who is a child of God, look for some fruit. The trouble with the church today, all we're looking for are gifts. We're running after people that have gifts. You can have a gift from God and go to hell with that gift. My Bible says the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And there's going to be some people talking in tongues while they go into the burning flames of hell. God is looking for a people who will walk right, talk right, live right in 1980 according to the commandments of God and walk in the way of holiness. We were down in Florida when... Hurricane Frederick hit. I went down into the Bahamas to preach at that time. God called me to go, and I didn't care where Frederick was. And they said Frederick petered out somewhere over in Puerto Rico, and we jumped the next plane. 
went down and preached and stayed a week in Bahamas. And the day we close our revival, the headlines come out, Frederick the Hurricane is born again. We got on the plane and lit out to Florida, and when we got there, it hit. But what I'm trying to show you is that the world has been hyped up on that word, born again, until it doesn't mean much. And we preachers, especially us Pentecostal preachers, have been sort of living in a lullaby. But I believe it's about time we come out and declare the truth and let the world know that born again means to be born again. I believe that this is a killer curse. Satanic inspire. It's a contagion of religion and moral superficiality. Carelessness that has come into the church. Carelessness, it don't matter how you live. Do your thing. It'll all come out in the wash. Three words. Carelessness, prayerlessness, and complacency. Just sitting in a pew and warming the pew. How in the world can you claim to be born again and you don't pray anymore? Prayerlessness. And this is the spirit that has moved into the church. It's a Laodicean type of spirit. It deceives people into thinking that they can survive spiritually on a mere verbal profession. Even preachers coming on radio just confess this every day and everything will be all right. It's going to take more than a verbal confession. It's going to take a positive possession that Christ lives on the inside of you. He said, I'll walk in you and I'll talk in you and I'll be your God and you shall be my people. I have a definition of a syndrome written, written down. It's a group of signs or symptoms that occur, that characterize a sickness, a sickness or an abnormality. That means you've been injected with just enough religion to keep you from catching the real thing. But thank God the real thing is going around. I would rather have the real born again experience knowing that I have passed from death unto life and that Jesus Christ is alive and on the inside. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me, somebody? This first chapter of John said he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They rejected him. They put him on a cross, and they crucified him. But to as many as believed on him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. They rejected him, but God opened the door to us Gentiles. And thank God, because we believe on his name, beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Sons of God. I love that title. I am a son of God. I don't care whether you're male or female, you're sons of God. Don't look at me like that, woman. We're all sons. You say, how in the world can I be a son when I'm a female? But the same way, how can I be a bride when Jesus comes when I'm a male? We are all one. There is neither male nor female in the sight of God. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither Jew nor Greek. I'll just add one more. There is neither black nor white, nor red nor yellow. But we are all one because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you folks are so proud of your roots and where you come from. I don't care where I come from. I don't even want to know. I don't, I'm not concerned about my roots. I'm concerned about the branch that I'm on. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branch. Branches are supposed to produce fruit, and by their fruits you shall know them. If you don't mind, I got my uh, fruit inspector's license with me. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. What kind of fruit? The fruit of the Spirit is love. You go into some Christian churches today, and you can't find love nowhere. Jesus said, how can you not love the man, your own brother, that you can see and say you love me and you can't see me? The love of the Father is not in him. When Jesus Christ comes into your life, it'll make the black man like the white man. It'll make the white man love the black man. It'll make the Baptists love the Methodists. The Lutherans love the Presbyterians. It'll make you love everybody because it's the love of God and it's a fruit that is spread abroad in your heart. I could spend all night on that, but let me get into some of them other fruit. We'll have a fruit market here tonight. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, 
the garment of praise. God said, I'll give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Some of you don't need healing in your body. You need to get your joy back. Somebody said, what you want me to do? Go around praising God all the time? Yeah. I'm reading from St. John's Gospel, chapter 1. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He that believeth that Jesus is Lord, he is born again. If you are born again, then you will want to obey the command of God when he says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Go around saying, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, and that with a burning fire. Don't even know what it means. Sanctification means three things, and I don't have time to bring it all up on this broadcast. Sanctification means you're separated from the world. It means you're set apart for the work of God. And it means you are filled with the Holy Ghost. This is what holiness is. This is what sanctification is. You don't have to carry a sign on your back to let people know you're holy. Jesus said, I'll walk in you. I'll talk in you. I'll be your God. And you shall be my people. The world will see Jesus Christ in your life because of the spirit of holiness that prevails in your life. It's a call to holiness. It's time for revival. It's time to get right with God. And it's time to be holy. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me. I am using as a text the 16th verse of this first chapter of Romans. So familiar to a lot of people. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. And I don't care who you are or how low you have gone in sin. I want you to know the power of that gospel will reach to the lowest hell and pick up a man or a woman and wash him in the blood of Jesus Christ and take out a stony heart and put in a new heart and clothe him with the righteousness of Christ and make him a son of God. This is the power of this gospel of Christ. In the first chapter of Romans, verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Oh, I want you to know we've substituted the power of the gospel with carnal weapons. And it's moved into the church. And all you can see is the display of the flesh and what man has been educated to do. But it's time for a revival. It's time to get back to the Bible base again. It's time to let God move. It's time to step aside and say, Holy Ghost, now you take over and do your thing. Can you shout praise the Lord? Not very long ago, I went into Haiti, Port-au-Prince. I was invited in there. I'd never been there to preach, and the Holy Spirit laid it on my heart to go in there. And I preached to 70,000 people in Haiti. Never saw anything like it. 20,000 on the outside of that stadium that couldn't get in. Do you know what started it off? Not an eloquent preacher, but one miracle. One miracle. I prayed a mass prayer over 35,000 people. The stadium wasn't packed on the opening night. I couldn't lay hands on everybody, but I prayed one prayer. One prayer, and the power of God began to fall, and people were getting healed. I was walking out of the stadium when a 12-year-old boy came and grabbed my leg and hung on for dear life, and, and I couldn't shake him loose, so I just dragged him with me. 
picked up the foot and dragged him. And he was talking in the Creole language. And I can't understand Creole. And one of the pastors who was taking care of me, he said, Brother Shambach, stop. The young boy's trying to tell you something. I said, I can't understand it. He said, I'll interpret for you. He said, the boy said he was born blind, 12 years of age. But when you prayed the mass prayer, the lights came on for the first time in 12 years. I picked that boy up and threw him into the arms of another preacher. I said, take him up on that platform and let him tell the story in his own language. I want you to know everybody in Port-au-Prince knew that boy. They heard the gospel preached, but they didn't come to get saved. But when they heard that boy testify that he was born blind, and now he can see for the first time, you couldn't get near the stadium the next night. One miracle brought the whole city out. It was not a gospel that was preached, but it was a gospel that was demonstrated. And that's what we come to San Jose for, to demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a weapon that God has put in the hands of preachers today. It is not by might, it is not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah! Hear me, preacher. I don't care who you are, you that are listening to this broadcast. If you're not able to demonstrate the gospel, you're not fit to preach the gospel. When God calls a man or a woman to preach, he said, the works that I do shall you do also. But not only these works, but greater works shall you do because I go to my Father. Jesus healed the sick. He cleansed the leper. He opened deaf ears. He unstopped the deaf ears. And he also caused the dumb tongues to speak. And I come to town to tell you that Jesus Christ is still alive. He's still opening blind eyes. He's still causing the lame to walk. Why? Wherever he sees faith, he will move mightily. The gospel that is preached with a demonstration of the Spirit. Can you raise both hands and shout praise the Lord with me? I tell a story about a young girl. My wife and I were pastoring a church back in the 50s. And I'll never forget her eye. She was in our Sunday school, and I was after the daddy, but the daddy never come to Sunday school. He'd drop her off. I was after bigger fish, and I was out there hiding behind the bushes. And when he'd come bring that little daughter, I'd step out in front of the car until he almost ran over me. I didn't do that no more. He found out what I was up to, so he used to drop her off halfway down the block, and she'd come walking to church. One day, my wife and I was on a vacation. We heard from the man on the other end of the phone, called me long distance, and he said, Brother Shambach, and he was weeping, called me brother. I didn't recognize the voice. And I said, who is this? And he told me who it was, and he said, I'm the girl's father. I said, oh, you're calling me brother now. Tried to run over me last time. Now you're calling me brother. You must need help. He said, Sharon's in the hospital. Her eye was shattered in a hundred pieces. Doctors want to cut it out. Sharon told me to call you and said, if you can just get the pastor to come and bring his bottle of oil, the doctors won't have to operate, but God will heal. Don't you tell me Sunday school doesn't pay off. Those children listen to what's being said. Jesus took a little child and said, unless you become as a child, you'll never enter into the kingdom of heaven. A child has faith. I said, I'll be there on the next plane. And to make this a short story, when I got there, two doctors were waiting for me. I used to be in that hospital every day for praying for people. I was on a first-name basis with these doctors. And when they saw me, they said, Bob, come quickly, man. We've got to get that girl up to the operating room. There's an infection that's set in. We've got to cut the eye out. He says, hurry up and go in there and do your thing so that we can take her up there. And I looked at him and I said, what makes you think that after I do my thing, that you're going to be able to do your thing. I said, I didn't get on this plane and come out here and pray for this girl so you can continue to do your thing. But I said, there's power to this gospel I preach. God's going to do something. And they didn't want to argue with me. They said, all right, we'll just go ahead in there. But instead of going in where the girl was, I went into the waiting room. I knew daddy was in there. This is the apple of his eye. There's something about them daughters that the daddy likes, you know. I got a daughter, and I know what, what he's going through. And I was out in, that upper, uh, out in that waiting room, and I saw him. And I said, all right, brother, I finally caught you now. You ain't running over, over me now. 
You've been running from God. I said, before I go in there and pray for that daughter, get on your face and get right with God. He cried out to God to have mercy on his soul. Them two doctors come running in there and said, hey, preacher, this ain't the trouble out here. The trouble's in there. I said, that's why you're a doctor, not a preacher. You don't even know where the trouble is. I said, we take care of the trouble out here. God will take care of the trouble in there. Can you shout amen, somebody? Hallelujah. When I went in there, I got my bottle of oil. Both doctors on both sides of me, and they watching me. They said, what do you got in that oil? What is that, holy oil? I said, no, that's my wife's frying oil, fried chicken in that stuff. It ain't nothing but oil. Get you out of a can. You mean you didn't get that from the Holy Land? Uh-uh. Got it down at, at, the, at the grocery store. Are you listening? There ain't no power in the oil. There's power in the gospel. Can you shout amen? The gospel said you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And I'm just simple enough to believe that if God said it, then he'll do it. There's power in that gospel to change your life. I told those doctors, I said, step outside the room while I minister to this girl. Oh, we want to watch you. I said, you don't let me in your operating room. Now, you get out of my operating room. That little girl, I never even bothered looking at the eye. I just anointed her in a simple prayer. I said, Father, in Jesus' name, heal the child's eye. Restore perfect vision. Amen. That's it. Simple prayer. It's not how you stomp your foot and how you shake your hands, but it's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. And the Lord shall raise them up. I turned around and saw those two noses at the door, and I motioned for them to come in. They were kind of upset with me, got a little testy, and they said, uh, can we take her now, Reverend? And they never called me that before. It was always Bob, you know. And now they get, and I said, well, you won't have to take her now. So what are you talking about? I said, well, didn't you tell me that I was in a hundred pieces? Of course it is. I said, look at it before you take her up. I saw one of them go over there and unzip that adhesive tape on that eye, picked up the corner of that thing and looked at it and put it back. When he put it back, he said, I don't believe it. I said, that's why I had you standing on the outside of the door. You can't even believe it while you're looking at it. I'm looking for people that will believe and can't see. You can't see anything, but you still have faith to believe God. Come on, shout amen, somebody. Jesus said, more blessed are they who believe and see not. I was preaching in that stadium in Pittsburgh. This lovely young lady holding a baby come and kiss me on my cheek. And I wondered who she was, but I didn't mind because she's such a pretty young lady. And I turned around and I said, I don't know you. She said, yes, you do. I'm Sharon. And she said, I heard you were in town and I had to come to tell you that I still got 20-20 vision in that eye. Oh, hallelujah. What God does, he knows how to keep you. If he can save you, he can keep you saved. There's power in this gospel. If he has power to heal you, he has power to keep you well. Can you shout amen, somebody? 